Councilman Woodford. Present. Mayor Swallows. Here. Vice Mayor Epps. Here. Councilman Albright. Here. All present. Thank you. Uh, consider approval of agenda as presented. Do we have any changes, additions to the agenda? You're not going to do your moment of silence. And... Ah. <laughs> it's been a long time since we've been up here. <laughs> <laughs> Would everyone please stand for a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I apologize. <laughs> okay. Any changes, additions to the agenda? Uh, we do have one addition. Uh, be item 15. Consider for approval resolution uh, R eleven ten fourteen commending Scott Stallings for his victory on the PGA tour. All right. To a motion for approval of the agenda as amended. So moved. Second. Second. All right. All vote. Five yes votes. Motion carries. Thank you. On to old business. Consider approval of minutes of council work session held on September twelfth, two thousand eleven. Motion to approve. Second. All right. All, all vote. Five yes votes. Motion carries. Okay, on to the new business. Item three. Hold a public hearing and consider on first reading ordinance 110916, rezoning a portion of 644 Whitson Chapel Road from RS20 single family residential to CL local commercial. Sponsors, Mr. James Mills. Mayor and Council members, the location of this property is depicted on the screen. This rezoning was initiated by the property owner, Ms. Wanda Fitzpatrick. The request is for a portion of her property, which is located off of East Spring Street, and the request is it be rezoned from RS20 to CL Local Commercial. There were no specific development plans submitted with the request. This property is contiguous with RS20 zoning to the north and west and with CL zoning to the south and east. The portion of her property proposed for rezoning consists of approximately 2.8 acres. At the July 20 or July 2011 meeting of the Planning Commission, a five lot subdivision of her property was approved, which created four lots off of Wisconsin's Chapel Road and a 4.53 acre tract accessed only from East Spring Street. The four lots, oh, maybe I should go over here and use the. Yeah, and you're at the wrong <laughs> podium. Well, I didn't want to stand over there and be in front of it, but I'll go over there. You just can't, this technology just gets you that. You can actually draw on that, you know. All right, I'll try to draw on it here. Let's see what we can do here. These are the four. Aren't you supposed to use the stylus? What? <laughs> Excuse me. I hate being the guinea pig. <laughs> okay, those four lots were cut off from it and will <laughs> remain a single family residential. Different colors, too. Okay, now For we will try to board. erase this. Yay. Hey, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Feel smarter? At <laughs> least <laughs> <laughs> you stay in the lines. You're enjoying it too much, Mr. <laughs> Shipley. Uh, these lots are 225 feet deep and, again, uh, would be remain as RS20 and could not be used as access to the portion of the property that's uh, being uh, considered for rezoning. Um, already, six-tenths of an acre of this property is zoned as uh, CL Local Commercial, this portion right here. So this is one entire track right here. This hook represents it, but that's a portion of that property. <clears throat> uh, our land use plan shows the northern majority of this property being best suited for lower density residential and the southern portion being best suited for local commercial. Um, the city of Cook was in the process of installing public sewer to serve these properties, which um, will be installed along Winston's Chapel through here so that each of these lots will have access to sewer and there are also easements being provided to get to, so sewer can be uh, provided to uh, the remainder of the property. 
East Spring Street, which is also U.S. Highway 70 North, is classified as a major arterial street upon which uh, commercial zoning is appropriate. Um, with very few exceptions, uh, the corridor along East Spring Street between Highway 111 and uh, 40 is limited to those parcels which have frontage on uh, the major arterial. And again, this track does have frontage on the major arterial. <clears throat> Ms. Fitzpatrick's property, let me see. Okay. Ms. Fitzpatrick's property is currently used for commercial purposes. It's the location of the previous, or, or was used for commercial purposes. It's the location of the Scarecrow Inn. Um, as a non-conforming use, it's non-conforming because it's zone residential, it could continue in perpetuity. It also can be expanded to include the entire piece of property. Um, another thing to note, and let me go to the next screen here. This rezoning would also leave a 130-foot wide buffer area to protect the residential area on Rockwell Drive. Um, in summation, the planning department believes this is a reasonable rezoning. The planning commission is recommended for the approval, and the planning department concurs with this recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Do I have a motion for approval? Moved. So moved. Second. All right, then. Second. Any questions? Council. Have you had any phone calls, Mr. Mills? We had a few calls um, and a couple of comments at the planning commission. The majority was concerned about what was happening. Just information gathering. Um, we do have, Anna Ruth, do you have anything to say about this one? No. We did have a few people uh, come to the meeting, but I don't know of any opposition. Okay. And you said that it already is acting as a commercial business or the scarecrow. It has been, yes, ma'am. And, and under the law now, that she could expand it. And in a non-conforming use, right? With a similar non-conforming use or a non-conforming use of the same classification as long as it's not discontinued for more than 30 months, two and a half years. So okay. it can be reopened and expanded to include the entire track, not just the portion that's being proposed to rezone. Right. They could expand on all of this <laughs> if they so chose. So, uh, state law prevents you from acquiring additional property, but you can expand on the existing property. So this protects the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I, this is this provides more protection to the neighborhood. We believe it does. Yeah. This plan department believes it does. And okay. Now, Ms. Burroughs asked if she's going to sell it. There, uh, again, I'll state there were no development plans submitted with this, so mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's the purpose for the rezoning. Yeah. It's purely speculative. I think she's been very considerate as a property owner about her neighbors and yeah. the buffer and mm -hmm. not letting Whitson Chapel Road be access to it. Been very good. Anything else from the council? All right, anything from the audience? Seeing none, all vote. Five yes votes, motion carries. <clears throat> all right, item four. Hold a public hearing and consider on first reading ordinance 110917, rezoning 1491 and 1493 West Broad Street from RS 20 single family residential to CL local commercial. Sponsors, Mr. James Mills. Mayor and Council members, um, this is the location of the properties being considered for rezoning. Here's an aerial view, and I'll go to the zoning in just a second. This request was initiated by Herb Ball on, prop on behalf of the property owners, Mike and Martin Migalori. Um, as you say, the request is rezoned from RS-20 to CL Local Commercial. <clears throat> um, there were no, again, uh, like the previous request, no specific development plans submitted with the request. These two parcels in their entirety consists of 63.1 acres and uh, already <clears throat> approximately 5.6 acres of the property is already zoned as local commercial which extends for a depth of 200 feet from the center line of uh, West Broad Street. There are two residential structures currently located on the property. I'll go back to that one. So you can see those two, sing two single family houses on the property there. <clears throat> it's contiguous with uh, CL zoning to the east, west, and south, and with single family zoning RS15 and RS20 to north, east, and west. <clears throat> the portions of the properties that were requested for rezoning consist of 57 and a half acres. So this remaining portion in here is 57 and a half acres, and they did request that the entire track be. <coughs> <laughs> 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 
<laughs> okay. Um, this track, uh, we already have commercial zoning. It extends quite a bit more than this current property. This goes back 600 feet here. Um, in reviewing this, we had a few concerns. One, if you can see from this map, there's a blue line stream that bisects the northern part of the property. Blue line streams are protected by our stormwater uh, ordinance. They're required to have riparian zones 50 feet in width on either side. Um, the, these are to set up the riparian zones and our stormwater regulations are designed to protect these streams. We had some concerns about rezoning this entire piece. We felt that that would lead to degradation of the stream, intense commercial development. We did have at the Planning Commission meeting some residents in this area that were also concerned about extending commercial zoning in here. The other uh, issue was, again, there were no specific development plans submitted with this, although we couldn't, uh, it's not a binding thing, but uh, without knowing exactly what's going to go in there, that we were also concerned about just a blanket, complete rezoning of this track. So the compromise that, or the recommendation that was uh, submitted by the Planning Commission is to extend the rezoning for a depth of 1,000 feet from the northern right-of-way of West Broad Street. This would allow a substantial amount of this to be developed commercially, um, but still providing a huge area. This would range between 800 and 900 feet in depth that would remain single family. Um, if in the future there is a development proposal for this that would need to involve additional properties, we could look at uh, further rezoning, but the recommendation from the Planning Commission, which the Planning Department concurs with, is to rezone for a depth of 1,000 feet from the northern right-of-way of, way of uh, West Broad Street. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Do I have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. All right. Any questions, comments from the council? I just have just one simple one. I guess those properties, RS-15 properties and RS-20 properties, looks like four that are, or five that are, no, one, two, three, four that are already on the, on the, on the west side. <laughs> Uh, have, have you had any calls or concerns from those folks in their in their property? On the west side in here? Right there. The one well, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. Let me go back to the aerial photograph. <coughs> this area is uh, a junkyard. Oh, okay. And it's zoned residential. We didn't uh, include this in the commercial zoning. That's something that we're going to continue to study. The owner of this property would like to have it redeveloped. But as a junkyard, as a non-conforming junk, he doesn't want it to remain as a junkyard. He'd like to have some other viable use. Single family is probably not a good use of this in terms of, uh, you know, the potential pollution that's occurred in there. So commercial use is probably better. That's not included in this. But to answer your question, though, no, we've not had any opposition from the property owners here. But since you brought it up, I want to let you put you on notice that we may be coming back and looking at some type of commercial zone and maybe extending this CL zoning over, over to here to encourage redevelopment. Another point that I didn't bring up in discussing this when I mentioned redevelopment, our, our land use plan, our 2030 plan, identified this area as an area for redevelopment, for revitalization. Um, these properties are right in here. So this fits in with our comprehensive plan also. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mills. Interesting. Any other questions, comments? No. Any questions, comments from the audience? Seeing none, all vote. Five yes votes, motion carries. All right, on to item five. <clears throat> Hold a public hearing and consider on first reading ordinance 110918, amendments to the zoning code. Sponsors, Mr. James Mills. Mayor and council members, the planning department's prepared a number of amendments. This is not going to read too well on here, <clears throat> but I'll try to go through them real quickly. A number of amendments to the zoning code. Um, the first amendment deals with uh, establishing additional standards for townhouses and condominiums. As you re may remember, in 2009, we amended the zoning code to encourage the construction of townhouses and condominiums in multiple locations throughout the city. Uh, we had modified standards to, uh, so that it would be a more popular and more frequent type of development, and that has occurred. But what's also occurred, we've had a number of instances where the townhouses and condominiums have been built, been built with four bedroom units which have uh, subsequently been rented out individually, basically making these mini apartment complexes. And that creates and can create and potentially creates several problems. One, if we classify it as it's actually been utilized as multifamily, then additional parking would have to be provided. Uh, when you've got one, you know, a family or 
one person living in each room, they have friends coming over, they may have roommates, so it can potentially create a lot of problems in terms of parking. It also uh, results in a lot more of the actual land being uh, covered with asphalt and buildings. So we're recommending that certain uh, restrictions be placed on townhouses and condominiums to clarify that they're single family developments. They're not intended as multifamily. These are intended as single family uh, residential developments. But it basically uh, limits the number of bedrooms for a, um, to a maximum of three on average for a development. So you could still have four in one, but then the others would have two, so that on average you don't exceed more than three bedrooms. There are also restrictions in here about um, kitchen facilities and bathroom facilities, but uh, that's the first amendment we would uh, recommend you consider. The second amendment um, in the ordinance revises the definition of billboard, and basically the wording that we're recommending we place in there is to clarify that a billboard is a commercial operation on which the space is leased or rented um, for that uh, for the advertising. The next amendment um, is uh, revising the fee schedule for all signs. I want to clarify this is not just for billboards. This applies to all signs um, and it uh, does represent uh, an increase for the larger signs in particular. Um, for example, if you're more than 300 square feet, um, the fee would be $2 per square foot in the future. Um, it also drops down the dollars per square foot requirement to 200. It used to be 250, so it, it will represent an increase. This will bring us in, uh, more in line with other communities our size and, and larger across the state. The next uh, proposed amendment deals with uh, temporary signs that have been located in the public right-of-way. Um, we talked about this at our work session. And, um, we've had some issues with uh, the little push-in signs that are located against the edge of the street. The ordinance currently prohibits these signs from being in the right-of-way, but it's nearly impossible for our codes officer to tell you, or anybody, to tell you where the right-of-way line is without a survey. Um, so we get them up against the road, and it, you know, it's, you'll have to go back and find the property owner and get a survey. Anyway, to clear this up, we've recommended we establish that it be no, that they can be no closer than 10 feet from the edge of the street. Now, there's two reasons why we want to do this. One, um, well, they're both safety reasons. One is uh, when they're too close to the street, it can cause visibility problems for traffic, especially at an intersection. The second is mowing of the public right-of-ways. And I think I informed you all that at least on one occasion, our mowers have hit one of these signs which sent a projectile through the door of a private citizen's vehicle. So we want to be able to prevent that. We feel like if we get them at least 10 feet back, that'll take them out of the mower zone. So that's why that amendment's proposed. The next changes are to the uh, standards for billboards. And uh, I've included the entire section in the ordinance. But I want to clarify, the only reason the entire section's in there, we've taken the wording out and similar off-premise signs. And that's recommended by a planning attorney out of a Nashville, uh, out of Nashville legal counsel that we got contacted to take that wording out. So that's why that whole section's in there. That's all, not all new requirements. The change is just taking that wording out. Now there are some specific changes and they're done primarily to address the sign farm issue. Um, where we had an area that uh, was annexed, six signs were planted and grew up, and now we have six signs that we, we've inherited. Um, this happened the day before, a couple of days before the annexation was official. We've, we've got those signs now. They can now be relocated. Um, but we didn't want to have to worry about that every time we annex somebody going out and putting up a lot of uh, billboards that will count towards our cap. So what we've done is we specified only the 121 21 billboards in our inventory, in our book, count towards being able to be relocated. Signs that we annex, they have the right to stay there. They have the right to tear down and rebuild on those properties. They do not count for relocation in the future. So that's what the, the primary purpose of uh, this amendment is. The next section of the zoning code that we're proposing to amend deals with uh, Buffer yards and screening requirements. Uh, <clears throat> currently, the code requires that when you have a more intense use against a less intense use, commercial, industrial against residential, that that commercial, industrial property owner has to provide a buffer yard of so many feet and, and a certain level of screening to protect that residential or lessen the impact on that residential property owner. Currently, our code allows the, develop, the, the commercial property owner to reduce the width of that buffer yard at his own volition, provided he increases his screen. 
Uh, we've had a number of complaints from adjoining residential property owners that they had no say so in that reduction. Uh, in many cases, the property owners, the residential property owners, would rather have that wider buffer yard than, you know, a ten, reduction down to 10 feet with an eight foot fence, which is what we get in a lot of cases. This change would require that the adjoining residential property owner has to approve a reduction. It can still happen, but that commercial property or industrial property owner has to get the permission, written permission, of the owner of the residential property. Okay, the last proposed amendment um, is more of a housekeeping matters. We have two uh, specific requirements um, that we follow in the Planning Commission that are included in our bylaws and rules and procedures, but they're not currently included in the zoning code. One is we want to make sure it's in our zoning code that um, when a rezoning or a zoning amendment is denied by the Planning Commission, that that petitioner has 30 days to appeal that to the council. If they go past the 30 days, then they have to wait for a year to resubmit. Uh, we don't want to be sitting hanging, you know, nine months from now, somebody come back and say, oh, I want to appeal that to the council, which we haven't done, but we feel more, be more comfortable if it's actually in the ordinance. And the second thing, which we also currently follow, but we want to make sure it's in the ordinance, that is when a um, rezoning or an amendment is denied, um, they have to wait 12 months, whether it's denied by the Planning Commission and not appealed to the council or denied by the council, they have to wait 12 months before they resubmit. So we're not hit every month with a continuous rezoning. But those are the amendments that are uh, recommended <coughs> by the Planning Commission and uh, also by the Planning Department. If you've got any questions, I'll be glad to try and answer them. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Do we have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Any questions, comments from the council? Very thorough. Could you go over that again? <laughs> <laughs> as long as I don't have to use this, I don't do it. <laughs> Just a comment. I, I'd really, I just really appreciate a lot, a lot of hard work went into this. This is, this is just a lot of stuff that, that we read and, and had a chance to go over. And uh, it's obviously a lot of work went into it. Thank you for all that. I, I did want to just make a comment that the um, section seven one about the land screening and, and buffering section. I really like that. I just like the idea of the owners getting involved uh, in the process of uh, what's going on in, what's going on next to their homes. Uh, I don't know. It just seems like. It seems like the city and, the, and your uh, board ends up being sort of the middleman with all this. And I like the idea of the, of, the, of the business owner and the residential owner getting together, so I'm trying to decide. To me, it's just being a good neighbor, and I, I really appreciate that. But I did have, I did have one question on the very, on the very last uh, one about, about 12 months. Yes, sir. Uh, in order to resubmit, if um, I, I was just thinking in, in my own personal sense, if I, had, if I requested something um, and was, uh, it was denied, uh, and of course, if I felt I was within my right to have to do whatever I was requesting, 12 months is an awful seems to be like an awful long time. Is that is that pretty much the, the, the industry standard, uh, James? Or is, are we do we seem to be? Does that seem to be? Is that no, a little long? No, I think that's the industry standard. Um, the what I didn't note this in here, but if you have new evidence, if something has changed then it can be submitted, resubmitted oh, okay. prior. But if it's the exact same request, okay. um, then that will be denied. And we've had some of those where um, whatever, and I don't remember the exact issues, but things have changed, and we've allowed them to resubmit okay. at a much earlier time. Okay. But if it's the exact same request, I, I, that's pretty much the industry standard that you wait a year. And if we don't have some cutoff in there, you'll have some that will just come and ask Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. But I, I do appreciate <laughs> Okay, I didn't. I didn't realize it. Yeah, if, if there are, if there are substantial changes, they can resubmit. Okay. Or if there's if there's new information that wasn't presented prior, and this has to be substantial information. But if it is, and we've allowed this on a few occasions to, for people to resubmit. Okay, great. I do have a question about the uh, setback, the ten foot setback on the the smaller signs, and and that pertains to political signs too, which I would just assume we didn't weren't able to use those at all, but. What is the penalty if you do catch some of those that are closer to the, the street, that they are not at the 10-foot setback? Then what? Well, um, the penalty, penalty provisions are provided in the, in the zoning code. Basically, you would take, if it's a repeated, what we'll do is uh, we'll take the sign down. Okay. That's to be, um, if they go back and put it back up and it's repeated, then we will have the uh, option of going to city court and fining it's a $50 a day fine is that right council that uh, we could 
the judge could have. It's a $50 fine, and if the judge finds that it's successive violations for each successive day, then he can impose $50 per day. But that's up to Judge Ledbetter. Yes. So basically what we're going to do is take it down. If it comes back up, we'll talk to the property owner, tell them it's an issue. We generally, Jeff, we try to work with people. We don't, you know. But we do have some uh, legal mechanism if we okay. choose to pursue it. Good. It gets a little tough when it's city council race. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Might be your, your next boss and you're pulling the <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Comments? Anything from the audience? Yes, yes sir. Could you just come forward and sure. uh, my name is Ron Graves. I'm uh, with Lamar Advertising. First off, I gotta tell you I wasn't sure I was actually allowed to come to this meeting without an attorney. Hmm. Trust me, the last city council would have got that joke. Yeah. And with no socks. So. <laughs> but actually, the reason I did come, I wanted to ask Mr. Shipley a question. And uh, I've been wanting to ask you this question for a little while, and I guess I just needed to find the right format to go ahead and, and do that. Is this being recorded? For mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Okay. I want to make sure I get this correctly. Are you really running the Haunted Half Marathon? <laughs> no. <laughs> I am. Uh, there's a lot of people ask me that question. <laughs> All right. I'll walk about three miles, I think. All right. Yeah, I gave up running a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> that you, scared me. I didn't know where you were. <laughs> you were worried for our city manager, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> you were set up. <laughs> All right. Anything else? What are we doing? Are we, I just got kind of blown away here a little bit here. We're, we're getting ready to vote on this You're thing. Right? Okay. <laughs> Unless you want to go through it again. No, no. Mm. Okay. Wake All up. Right. Attention deficit there. All right. I'll, I'll vote. Bob, Wake yes up. votes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. All right. On to item six. We are a little rusty, aren't we? Uh, consider author, item six. <laughs> Consider authorizing Waller, Lansden, Dorch, and Davis as bond counsel for the $4 million electric system revenue and tax bond. Sponsors, Mr. Mike Davidson. Clickers over there. <clears throat> I may have to move over there. Uh, Mayor and council members, we started several months ago in preparing for a bond issue for the electric system. Uh, the funds would be used to construct the electric substation uh, south, uh, southwest of Interstate 40 down in the Highlands Industrial Business Park area. Uh, again, we started this back in, this, in the, actually in May to get to this point, and this will engage Waller, Lans Lansden, Dorch, and Davis, Alex Buchanan with that law firm to act as bond counsel for us. Their fee for this bond issue would be $15,000. Uh, it'll be paid for from the bond proceeds, and they've worked with us the last two bond issues we've had, but I'd recommend your approval. Thank you, Mr. Davidson. Do we have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Second. Questions from council? No. Comments? Any from the audience? Thank you, Mr. Davidson. Seeing none, I'll vote. Five yes votes. Motion carries. All right. On to item seven. Consider authorizing Stevens Incorporated as financial advisor and bond fiscal agent for the $4 million electric system revenue and tax bond. Sponsored, Mr. Mike Davidson. Again, Mayor and Council, we've been working with Stevens for the last couple of well, several years for uh, with bond issues. Uh, this is uh, would engage Stevens to act as bond counsel, a bond advisor, financial advisor for the city. Uh, the total fee that would be paid to Stevens for financial advisor would be twenty thousand dollars. There's some additional fees for preparing various documents that go into related to this issue. Those uh, additional fees. Uh, amount to another $6,500. There's also, in addition to this, an $8,000 fee that would be paid to Moody's for a rating on this bond issue. Again, these these expenses would be paid out of the bond proceeds, and it's factored into that, and uh, I'd recommend your approval. Thank you, Mr. Davidson. Uh, motion for approval. Motion to approve. Second. Any questions? Any comments from the audience? Seeing none, all vote. Five yes votes. Motion carries. All right. Item 8. Consider Resolution R-1-11-12. Initial resolution authorizing the issuance of not to exceed $4 million general obligation bonds 
uh, revenue and tax of Cookville, Tennessee sponsored Mike Davidson. And council members, this is the initial resolution that will be published in the local paper. Uh, related to this bond issue, it is to construct the uh, electric substation down in the Highlands Business Park area. Uh, the, uh, these will be designated as bank qualified traditional tax exempt bonds. It does pledge the revenue of the electric system to pay the debt service on this, on this issue. And they'll be sold later, uh, hopefully in December, uh, at a competitive sale. And again, Stevens will help through that process. But again, I'd recommend your approval. Thank you, Mr. Davidson. Motion for approval. So moved. Second. Any questions, comments? When will this go in the newspaper? <clears throat> we'll get it in the paper, hopefully Sunday. If they can, if not, it'll be in Monday's paper. Did you say there was 20 days that people have to respond to this, whatever, and then after the 20 days, then you can move forward? There's 20 days. Uh, once we get it in the paper, the 20-day time frame runs, and that gives the public notice that we're looking at borrowing $4 million and gives them the opportunity to uh, put a petition together if they would like to protest this or not. But that's what that's for. Thank you. Uh, anything else? It's pretty standard. That's a pretty standard with all our bond issues that go in the paper. Uh, and to put the public on notice that we're borrowing funds. All right. Seeing none, all vote. Five yes votes. Motion carries. Item nine, consider resolution R111013, authorizing the issuance of not to exceed $4 million in aggregate principal amount of electric system revenue and tax bonds for the city of Cookville. and providing the details there. I'll sponsor Mike Davidson. Again, Mayor and Council, this is just the details resolutions that sets forth everything you could think of about this bond issue. Uh, and I recommend your approval. <laughs> I so move. Second. Second. All right. Any questions? Seeing none. <clears throat> All vote. Five yes votes. Motion carries. Thank you. Out of 10. Consider awarding bid for service truck of the gas department. Sponsors, Mr. Mike Davidson. Mayor and council members, we recently opened bids for a new truck that uh, is used to uh, pull our trencher that we use to install gas lines. It's used to pull that trencher around town. That truck, the one it's replacing, is a 1992 model vehicle. Uh, I'd recommend approval of low bid to Tennessee fleet sales for $38,727. All right. Motion so, for approval. So moved. Second. Questions, comments? So the last one was bought in 1992? 1992. I think we got our money's worth. We have gotten <laughs> our money's worth out of that one. Yeah. That one was $27,000 when it was purchased in 1992. Wow. Mm -hmm. so. Hasn't gone up that much. I no, see. yeah. All right. Any other questions? Nope. Seeing none, I'll vote. Five yes votes. Motion carries. <clears throat> Thank you. Item 11, consider approval of emergency motor repairs at the water plant. Uh, water Quality Control Department sponsor, Ronnie Kelly. Mayor and Council, uh, we recently had one of our 700-horse uh, raw water pump motors uh, had a bearing failure. We needed to get it out, taken out of service, and had the local Cooper Electric Motor, which is the pump rep here, we had them take it down and repair it and replace the bearings, and we need authorization to pay the bill. It's eighteen thousand three hundred thirty dollars and fourteen cents. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Do I have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Any questions? I have a question. Just, Ronnie, does this come out, this come out of your budget or? Yes, it it's, it's a. We have a, a equipment maintenance item. I'll be bringing. We just had a, a thirty-five thousand dollar forty-year-old part that we just ordered today for a one of the big clarifiers mm -hmm. that we had to order back from the manufacturer. So I'll be coming, but we put a line item in our budget every year to take care of these things that happen. Okay. And, and this, this line item, is it, I mean, is it with this addition plus that 35, that 35, is it still, yeah, we're going to be running up close to it. Okay. <laughs> I think we budget and I can't remember this year what we budgeted. We were at 60, $80,000 a year because of if you have a big pump go down or if you have yeah. a, Sure. whatever go down they're big ticket items usually in some oh. years you may not use as much of that item and the next year you may use a lot of yeah it. how old was this pump motor this one yeah, right. this one's a new one it was a new one it brought mm -hmm. down? fairly new we're, we're we're in heated discussions with the manufacturer <laughs> but, so is there a warranty that you know of? no it's out of warranty really 
Yeah. We're having some good discussions. <laughs> you don't expect to have any, I mean, if you're, if you're running pretty close to the number, do you, would you expect to come back to us with the budget amendment for your, for your department in order to fund, to for, fund that line item? For these repairs? Yeah. No. Okay. Great. Any questions? Seeing none. All vote. Five yes vote. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, on item 12, consider awarding bid for HVAC system for Cookville Performing <coughs> Arts Center. Leisure Services Department sponsor, Mr. Rick Woods. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. We uh, advertise and receive bids for the replacement of the original HVAC systems at the Cookville Performing Arts Center. Um, and we received three good bids, and we're recommending uh, car while mechanical contractors as a low bid meeting specification, and I recommend your approval. Thank you, Mr. Woods. I have a motion for approval. Motion so to approve. Moved. Second. Uh, any questions, comments? From so the air conditioning unit that's there now, that's original to the building? Yes. Wow. Wow. Yes, there are three 15-ton units there, um, and they are the original units that were uh, in, put in the building when it was originally built and opened in 1978. <laughs> wow. Never see it. That's some shelf that, life. That's that's pretty good. Well, the company did that's I mean, well, never mind. I'll just say let's get them again. They got our we got our as Alma would say we got our money's worth out of out of that one. <laughs> I, I just have a question. It's basically the same thing I just asked Ms. Davidson. You know, that coming out of your, do you have a lot on them for, for this also? This is a budgeted item uh, in capital expense this year. I, I don't remember exactly. Okay. A lot of our major purchases this year were funded in various aspects of, of the city budget, and I don't remember exactly which oh, one yeah. this came, whether it's a bond issue, whether it's our capital, or whether it's capital outlay note. There are three different ways that. Uh, okay. that our items were, were budgeted, but this was budgeted for this, okay. this fiscal year. It was in a bond issue, the upcoming bond issue, and I think we budgeted $100,000. We, yeah. yeah. we did. Great. Okay, thanks, Rick. 25 under budget then. We're close. Yes. Good. I assume this is an energy efficient unit? It is energy efficient, and, and we looked very uh, closely at that and, and made some changes to that um, to make sure that we, we were being as energy efficient as we could be. Right. Good. Okay. Need any questions? Seeing none, all vote. Five yes votes, motion carries. All right, item 13, consider awarding bid for SOD for Dogwood Park. Mr. Rick Woods. Mayor, members of council, I, I'm happy to report that the irrigation is done, is complete at yeah. Dogwood Park, <laughs> and we're ready to put down grass. <laughs> Okay. And so we advertise and receive bids on sod, and we're looking at a blended turf-type fescue that we will be putting down at <laughs> Dogwood Park. Um, and we're recommending the low bid meeting specifications as southeastern turf out of Eagleville, Tennessee. Gave us a very good bid. We did send, uh, ask our maintenance superintendent to go down and actually look at the turf this past week after the bids were opened. Um, and he came back and reported that it looked really, really good. It was good density, a good quality grass. They had about 40 acres of it, and we don't need quite that much. Uh, but they're ready to go, and we're happy that uh, they gave us a very good competitive bid, and I would recommend your approval. Thank you, Mr. Woods. Do I have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Questions? Uh, just a quick one. You know, with the, with the trees, I think the, the nursery had sort of, a, I guess, a, a guarantee as much as you can. Do we, do we get... Do you get that with turf? Is there some sort of a, uh, if, if for some reason it shows up and it's been diseased, it's been diseased or et cetera? Um, yeah, we will go back to them in that case. We don't have a specific time guarantee on that, but they do have licensure that, that warrants them that says, through the state, that says they have been inspected um, for, uh, for diseases and for um, pests. Okay. Um, and so... Uh, we have some way of going back to them to say, look, this is this is what we got, and we need to, to make this right. Yeah, I guess that was just my concern. If you put it in, 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 in as in a tree, if it two months later you've watered it, you've done everything you're supposed to, and th it's not growing, I mean, do we have any recomp recompense at all? It's always a very difficult thing to to verify yeah. and to prove. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But uh, right. we would certainly have those conversations with them. 
We can probably put somebody out there and let them watch the grass grow, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My job. <laughs> You'd be good at that. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? People sleep all the time. All right. Seeing none, I'll vote. Bob, yes, both motion carries. <clears throat> All right, on to item 14. Consider awarding bids for benches and trash receptacles for Dogwood Park. Sponsors, Mr. Rick Woods. Again, we're getting very close to uh, the completion of this phase of development of Dogwood Park, and we're very excited about that. Uh, we advertised for benches and trash receptacles to be placed in Dogwood Park. Um, we got uh, seven bids, and we're recommending Victor Stanley Incorporated as the low evaluated bid meeting specifications for both benches and trash receptacles. I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I'd recommend your approval. Thank you, Mr. Woods. Do I have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Any questions, comments from council? Mr. Woods, do, does um, this company guarantee their work or there is a warranty on the benches of 10 years um, on each bench um, and that's very good that's higher than any of the other warranties that we that we saw on any others that we that um, that were submitted on bids has the city done business with this company before we have and we have uh, their product um, in various locations and, and a lot of it in the new uh, trailheads that we have for our rail trail project we have their benches and trash receptacles the exact same thing that we're looking at here we have their trash receptacles out in front of the performing arts center uh, those are recent purchases um, and it's a very good quality very uh, high standard uh, quality uh, product did they give you any idea when they could get the products to us they will be delivered by November November the 1st okay and that's very important right for the it is important for us because we need to complete this phase of development um, by early November um, to to complete that for our grant reimbursement. Okay. Certainly, people want to be able to sit on <clears throat> benches in the park, and every time I walk over there, and I do walk to the park about two or three times a week, there's always somebody also besides me walking there. So I'm looking forward to having a little place to sit. Right. Of course, and these are the benches, too, that, that we have the sponsorships, right? Yes, we have um, sponsorships, and we still have plenty of sponsorship uh, bench sponsorships available. Uh, but we have some of those benches that have been uh, sponsored already, mm -hmm. and we will be putting plaques on those benches to uh, recognize those sponsorships, those gifts. Any other questions? No. Nope. Seeing none, all vote. Uh, yes, both motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Woods, if you don't mind me asking, could you give us just a little bit of update about Dogwood, Dogwood Park? I mean, you said the irrigation is finished. Sod is about ready to go. Um, we should, uh, yes, we're ready to put down sod. We'll call them tomorrow, ask, we'll, we should be laying, g given good weather, we'll be laying sod next week. Okay. Um, now it'll take a while because we have uh, 16,000 square yards of sod to put down. So it'll take some time to get all of that completed. Um, we will have the benches here by the 1st of November and uh, ready to install. Um, we have uh, uh, trees, some trees, additional trees that need to be planted, some shrubbery that needs to be planted, um, some additional trees, and some trees that need to be replaced mm -hmm. that have uh, died. Um, and that is scheduled to be done within before November the 1st as well. Okay. Uh, we've talked with the, with the tree contractor about that. Okay. Um, so all that is scheduled. Once those things, trash receptacles, uh, benches are in place, the sod is down, we need to put up some signage, it will be complete with this phase. Okay. Good. So November the 1st is an important date. We'll say it's that. an important date, and uh, we plan to be, if we have continuing good weather like we've had this past week, we will be complete. Good. Thank good. You. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate that. All right, on to item 15. Uh, consider approval of resolution R111014, commending Scott Stallings for his victory on the PGA Tour. And here's the resolution. Whereas a, a successful round brought victory and recognition to Scott Stallings in the 2011 Greenbrier Classic Golf Tournament, and whereas Scott's successful profile 
also brings recognition to Tennessee Tech University in Cookville, Tennessee. And whereas Scott is a Tennessee Tech alumnus, having played golf under the guidance of Coach Bobby Nichols for the Golden Eagles from 2003 to 2007, and Scott was named Ohio Valley Conference Player of the Year twice, as well as being named Division I All-American. And whereas turning pro in June 2007, Scott embarked on a career in the game of golf, earning three top ten finishes while on the Nationwide Tour in 2009. And whereas earning his PGA Tour card in 2011, Scott went on to win his first PGA tournament on July 31, 2011 in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, by qualifying for a three-way playoff with a birdie at the final hole. And in that playoff, victory was achieved for Scott with yet another birdie. And whereas support for Scott was evident in the community as Cookvillians recalled their cheers and excitement while following his scores as he played his successful final round at the Greenbrier, and whereas by returning to the community of his college alma mater, Scott demonstrates his desire to give back to the community and the TTU Golden Eagle Golf Program by participating in A Night with Scott Stallings on October the 14th, 2011. And whereas Scott has shown commitment and dedication to self, the game of golf, and to the communities he has called home, and now, therefore, be it resolved by the City Council of Cookville, Tennessee, that on behalf of the citizens of the City of Cookville, deepest appreciation is hereby extended to Scott Stallings for his achievements and service in this community. Extended also our best wishes for much success as he continues his career on the PGA Tour. Now, therefore, be it further resolved that this resolution shall be duly recorded and filed in the City Clerk's Office, adopted this sixth day of October, 2011. Is this something we have to approve? Yes. Motion for approval. Motion. Oh, man. Second. All right, any comments? <clears throat> Anything from the audience? That's great. Seeing none, oh, all vote. Five yes votes, motion carries. All right, and this is the part of our meeting. Uh, before we open the floor for hearing of citizens and or delegations, if anybody wants to come forward and speak their mind, we all we do is ask you to keep it to about three three minutes if you can. Uh, just say who you are and yes, sir. fire My away. My name is Jesse Stewart, and I am very much out of my comfort zone. The first thing is I placed these cards up there at your table, and I hope I wasn't out of line in doing so. I would love for you to read them, study them, Google the things, and study it over. We have some dangerous stuff coming into this city. It's in our country, the United States. We have got to get it stopped. The second thing that I wanted to inform you about is we've got a future president coming to Cookville, Tennessee, and he will be at the Southern Hills Golf Course, uh, Mr. Herman Kane. He won the straw poll in Florida. And he's coming for a fundraising breakfast, and would love for all and every one of you to participate. And thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Yes, ma'am. I'm Judy Butler from Beverly Hills Subdivision. Um, someone asked us why we live in that subdivision. We moved into it in 1985. At that time, it was a beautiful, peaceful neighborhood. Uh, I feel I have the right to ask the council this question. It may for, be for Mr. Mills, but my, it's my concern, and I'd like to know, does the city regulate and enforce the, the codes for the rock quarry up there? Who enforces those? Who enforces the codes for the rock quarry? Yes. Mr. Mills. I think it would depend on what codes you're referring to. Anything but blasting. All other codes. Uh, well, of course, it's uh, grandfathered in as a non-conforming use. It was subsequently rezoned to QM, but it was already grandfathered in. So I don't know what particular codes. They've not had any additional zoning code violations that I'm aware of. There is no code, no regulation for them at all with the city of Cooper when they were zoned in, grandfathered in. You have none for a rock quarry? The ma'am, they have, they have, we went, oh gosh, and it actually was very informative. We actually have, there's a, there's a, a book in our, in our records that our lawyer, uh, uh, Mr. Rader, had went, that had 
went and looked at this this quarry extensively, mostly to get a lot to get us up to speed, but to try to get the public basically an overview of what's been going on with this quarry for years and years and years and years. And um, I, I would recommend that you get your hands on that. If you can get your hands on that, we can get you a copy of that, okay. so you can kind of see what goes on. One of the things that I learned is that there there's there's lots of rules that quarries have to follow, inspections, etc. That they that they have to follow. If they don't do that, they'll get fined. We can't we can't do that because that that's that is state those are state and maybe federal law they they certainly supersede our codes but if anybody ever has violates a code in, in our city uh, I mean a city code then we would certainly we would certainly look into that and try to take care of it as a matter of fact one of the things James that we looked at was covering covering the trucks correct yes but we found out that that's was uh, we we could not enforce that is that correct is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, we have spent some time trying to look at that and, and regulate that to make sure the quality of life for our citizens in your area are, are, is kept as okay. best as possible. So I, you ought to get that book. That okay. really is very, very helpful. And we can – is there – Jim, is there some way we can get yeah, her, we, yeah, we have get her a copy of that? Okay. And if you, after you read that, if you have any other, certainly any other questions about that, make sure and you know come back and either contact Mr. Shipley or. or <laughs> I'm not it, sure it, I can find it tonight, but. Well, that's okay. I can talk by and get it. I, but we we were just, I was just wondering, for my own concern, if there was any code regulations within the city, not just the state, but the city, mm -hmm. that would be you know under control that we could control in the city as a citizen of, of Cooper, you know, that we have our rights in our homes and things, and we need yeah, to know. Yeah, we've, we've looked. We've looked into that, and our lawyer looked into that extensively, and certainly if there was something we can do to make sure, and as a matter of fact, the city has done some things in order to try to, to take care of that, and that was doing some zoning things. Mr. Mills could explain that a little bit more fully, but doing some zoning things in order to try to to try to try help them develop in such a way that it's it's less of an issue for the for the neighborhood. So, But that book would help address a lot of that. Well, yeah, I think that's correct, but what, what we do have in place – and again, I will stress as a non-conforming use, there's very little at all that we can do. By putting it in the QM zone, <clears throat> if they do additional uses, for example, concrete plant, asphalt plant, then we've got all kinds of regulations they have to meet in terms of buffer, in terms of operation, in terms of maintenance that we can apply because these are new uses. Um, but in terms of the core and the zoning code, there's, I don't, there's very little we can do. So there's no uh, there are, but there are state and federal regulations, which have been researched thoroughly by, by uh, Mr. Rader. And like I said, Mr. Shipley has a copy of those. Um, and I, mean, I guess she could get a tape, a, a copy of the meeting where yeah. he went through this yeah, in yeah. depth. If you didn't attend, I don't know if you were there at that meeting. That'd be great, yeah. There's options for the property owners out there that you guys can take. Right. That's what I understood him to say. That's right. Danny, you might want to, can you speak on that? I mean, you could file suit for nuisance against the quarry directly and, uh, you can probably get a lot more relief than the city of Cookville ever could could get, um, and that's probably the best remedy and uh, the most creative remedy. And I think that that's been done in the past a number of times. Yes, yeah, that was done in the past, and it actually the the judge found in the favor of the neighborhood. That's right. But did, nothing happened after that. Miss right. Butler, I do I do remember in that book though it it kind of spells out who to call for certain things, okay. uh, and it was I mean it, I mean it gave me a lot of information I never knew too so. Uh, I do remember I was very, very impressed with it. So I would, I mean, it's that's a good place to start. Okay. Okay. Because um, I was wondering, you were saying like the communication between commercial and the actual homeowners or the people that are living there in those areas, like with the signs and things, you know, there has to be something that we can do that we can, you know, just say, I can't do anything. Mm -hmm. Well, for, for new uses, we, we could. The one, the one thing by the new code that we've tried to encourage um, is that a better way to access the property be provided if they do add other uses um, it is required in the code it is by the zoning code that they have to have a route that's away from the residential area um, that will provide you protection but they have to take that step to whether or not they want to add the the concrete plan or the other uses there without that we really through zoning i don't know have any options all right, thank you. I'll get a hold of one of those books. Thank you very much. Gail, Thanks, just you, indicate, you know where it is, don't you? Yeah, we can, get, we can give you one tonight. Uh, Mine's out of the truck. You can borrow one, but you can't have it. <laughs> uh, all right, Any, anyone else? Any other? I've got a couple of announcements. Uh, it's busy in the city of Cookville for the next couple of weeks. The, I've gone blank. Oh, lunch in the 
lunch at the depot? What's it called? Brown bag lunch. Brown bag, Brown bag, Brown bag lunch. lunch. <laughs> Brown bag lunch starts tomorrow, and it's every Friday in uh, the month of October. It's a free concert. I think it starts at 1130 and goes to 1. And then uh, right now, right across the street in Dogwood Park is uh, Shakespeare in the Park. And um, I've gone to it at times where you needed to wear your long johns. And I think we're going to have a little respite in the cold. So um, that's free to the public. And it begins at 7 o'clock tonight. And now you don't even have to take your chair. You've got nice stadium seating there. There was one other thing that I was going to announce about leisure services. Is that it? <laughs> Mr. Woods. You're on, you're on there. But at any rate, I just, yeah, there you go. Well, it's just a great time to be out and about and hope that people will come to the brown bag lunch and then also to Shakespeare in the Park. Oh, that's right, and WCTE is having their Blues and Brews tomorrow night, and you can contact WCTE for a ticket for that. And then um, there will be the Bacchanal on October 23rd, which benefits the Appalachian Center for the Arts. Appalachian Craft Center for the Dang. Arts. You're just full of information. Boy, I am. See, Good. this is what happens when I don't teach. I, I have to talk. This concludes the announcement section of your program. <laughs> um, I also have one, though. Um, Cityscape is partnering with Leisure Services, uh, First United Methodist Church, First Presbyterian in the West Side to host Boo Bash on Broad. Uh, it will be Monday, Halloween, October 31st, from 6 to 8 p.m. Leisure Services is hosting a costume contest and other activities, including a, and I have a question here, including a flash mob. Aren't those supposed to be kind of secretive? You don't know what a flash mob is? Oh, I do know what they are, but okay. it's supposed to be a little secretive. Oh, right. is it? Oh, yeah. yeah. So anyway, we're announcing a flash mob. Uh, <laughs> well, we're new at it. Yeah, I so know. <laughs> Doing thriller, trunk, or treating, face painting, etc. We are expecting 3,000 to 4,000 kids from the community. We have also been offering gently used costumes for those who bring in a canned good item. So... I'll, we'll announce that again in a couple of weeks just to remind everyone. But uh, I have one announcement, too. Yes, sir. Halloween, October 31st, will be celebrated on October 31st. That's uh, profound. We are getting, I bet we've had a couple of hundred calls. Are you going to, you know, Halloween's falling on Monday. Are you going to have it on Saturday or something? No, we're not. Uh, first, I don't know that I have the authority to change a <laughs> holiday. I had a call from the mayor of Livingston today. We don't know when we were going to celebrate. They don't know anything. So up there. it it falls on October thirty first, and that's when it. That's Halloween. Be careful! I got canned folk. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anything else? All right. This meeting's adjourned. <laughs> I'll call it. Just mm -hmm. Yeah, we do.